right, open your Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And uh, I said to first service that I, it's kind of an announcement, sort of, but next week we will conclude our studies in the book of Revelation. I, Aaron's tarting it because first service. Thank you, Aaron, for trying. I appreciate it. Uh, first service let out a, 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 co a collective sigh of sadness. I w yeah, it was very grassroots, yeah, but uh, I, I was happy. I was like, wow, people, you know, because, okay, it, there is, you can kind of, in some circles, there's kind of an unwritten rule that people kind of will roll their eyes if you spend too long teaching out of a certain, you know, book or whatever, and I hope that, that, that that's not the case here. Uh, there's a feller in London that I think spent um, 10 years in the book of Acts. <laughs> yeah, that's a season. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it's worth it. You never know. I mean, there's lots of stuff. I mean, look, we only have one Bible, so, right? How many times have you seen Dr. Zeus? So just, anyway. You, all right, so open your, having your Bibles open to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, we're going we're gonna to finish what we started last week, and then next week we will finish chapter 22. Uh, it's the 1st of November. We'll also have communion next week. Uh, I've asked Aaron to, get, to give me the opportunity to lead worship next week, so it'll just kind of be a uh, Sunday of just to celebrate and look back and celebrate what Christ, who Christ is and what he's done. So just be ready for that, and I do hope that you will uh, consider tonight's service as well to remember it's water baptism. Even if you're not being baptized, we could sure use your faith in the room, right? Yeah, right. All right. Okay, so if you found Revelation chapter 22, let me... Uh, let me read the verses that we'll cover today, and then we will kind of reintroduce that. We're, we're, we're going to look at the first five verses. Last week we did the first three and a half, but let me just remind you where we came from. Are you ready? There he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit in every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him and they will see his face <laughs> I like to I like to wait and see who's got their their uh, their antenna up I can always count on my mom no I mean that I, I can verse 4 let me say it again lean into this Lean into the word, please. Here we go. And they will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. Illumine. That's new, that's new American standard for the Lord God will shine on them. And they will reign forever and ever. What we see in Revelation 21 and 22 describe the, the, the promise of the age to come. What we celebrate about heaven, what we, when we talk about heaven and eternity, we're talking about what we see in Revelation 21 and 22. Up until then, Revelation is, is talking about the, the history of redemption and God's actions and providence and in judgment and, 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 these, and these mysterious pictures of, of, uh, of, of, of redemptive history with you know, dragons and beasts and all the symbolism that's telling the story and some of it telling what has happened and what will happen. But by the time we get to Revelation 20, that's when the, what we would say with the parousia happens. The return of Christ. Christ comes for his bride. We are living as betrothed now, but there will come a day when he comes for us. 
There'll come a day when he comes for us and we will, we will return and be with him in a, in a bridal uh, a march, a bridal parade, and we will be rejoined with him. Then there will come a time where there will be judgment at the great white throne. That's going to be remarkable. No one will be able to hide. Everybody who's ever had breath will stand before the Lord and give an answer for their life. There'll be books about their works and then one book that'll have their name in it. And that's the book, the book of life that's been talked about all through the scriptures. And then when that book is closed, that's the end. But it's not the end, it's the beginning. That was just the end of the beginning, but now it starts. Then from that point on, we we will live in in time without end, in in heaven for eternity. And that's what we're talking about. Revelation 21 and 22 tell us what that's all about. And this, this brief blip, this brief moment called history, called life, will be but a blip on the radar, and we will live forever as described in Revelation 21 and 22. So it's important that we see what's in there because when the New Testament talks about the promise or our inheritance, you ever heard those phrases, promise, inheritance, or what will be revealed or what will come on the great day of the Lord? All of those things are looking forward to something that is actually revealed to us somewhat symbolically still, but revealed to us in the, in the 21st and 22nd chapters of Revelation. So it's, it's really important to see them. Furthermore, I would add this for fun, that I don't even think you can really grasp the, the fullness and the, and the depth and the texture of the Old Testament, of, of, of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the Book of Twelve, the, what we call the minor prophets. They're only minor because they wrote smaller books, but they have a major impact. Okay? So we call it the Book of Twelve. But you, to even read those passages and see those prophets and hear what they describe as what will, what will come about someday, if you haven't read the Book of Revelation, it will, might leave you scratching your head. And you, you, it forces you to think, well, I wonder when this was fulfilled or when that happened or maybe, this, maybe we missed that or maybe they were wrong. But no, no, no. What you understand is when you, read, when you read 21 and 22, we see that all of the concepts, all of the symbols here, all of the, the, the things that John sees, they are a fulfillment of long-term biblical hope. Because the same Holy Spirit that breathed upon Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and, and when they, they would begin to see images of a great day of beauty, of glory and, and they would talk about, about no more war and they would talk about light and glory and the reign of God and God's perfection. They were, they were seeing with the same Spirit that breathed upon all the writers of Scripture because what we see in 21 and 22 isn't a last minute thought from God. It is God's plan. And all of redemptive history has been moving toward this. Furthermore, what we see, (laughs) 6,000 Congolese people were sitting in the room. And there was the founding missionary of the church. Her husband had passed away, and she sat like a matriarch up in her office overlooking the service from a window. After service, she called me up to her office. She said, you know, you're not a, she said, she looked at me and she kind of looked at me and she thought, she said, you, she said, you, you appear to be a bit older. She said, but you can't be a very old man because you bounce around too much. <laughs> You'll never know. The thing is, it's just very exciting. Here's the deal. Everything that we see in Revelation 21 and 22 represents a reversal and a restoration of what was lost in the fall. That which was marred and affected by sin, God refused to lose. See this, and this is to give us hope. See, he's a redeemer. He's a restorer. He can't lose it. 
Sin may have marred it. Sin may have destroyed it. It may seem like it's lost and gone and without hope. But that's not, but see, we serve the God of all hope. And Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Meaning everything that was lost, everything that was marred and destroyed in the Garden of Eden, everything man lost, all of the hope and all of the promise and all the stuff that he lost and the despair that set in, God said, not on my watch. He will have the last word. And because of Jesus Christ, because of his redemption, God is a restorer of all things. And let me tell you what, if he can restore the cosmos itself, he can restore your life. He can reach into your life and your kids and your marriage and your past, and there's nothing that's too far for his arm. His arm is not too short. His reach is not too shallow. He can reach it. He can save it. He can redeem it. He can restore it because that's who he is. And when we see in Revelation that he restores everything, if he says, behold, I make all things new, then that can certainly mean me and you. So not only do we look at it with a, with a tremendous sense of promise in the future that thrills our hearts with hope, but what we see in our future also should determine our focus. Our future should inform our focus. Because if that's who we are and that's the reality that will prevail, then we might as well get on the right side of it now. There is an avalanche coming. I want to be on the right side of it. You might as well live on the right side of this thing now. You must live today like people of that day. You have been stamped with the promise, with the reality that, it, that transcends this one, that will outlast this one. You've been stamped with eternity. You should start living like it today. And that's what Revelation helps us do. We live today like people of that promise. All right. We've already read through it. This is what it looks like. The first part, the first part three through 3A three last week was paradise restored. Woo! Wonderful Jesus. Now, today, the second part of, of uh, that is just three and a half through verse five. That's it. Two and a half verses. <laughs> and I'll still go to the end of church. But two and a half verses. I've done two chapters in this long. Two and a half verses. But see, here's the thing. Every single, every single mention of something, you could... If you wanted to, if you wanted to be a super student of sorts, you could extract each phrase and you could look at that one phrase through the, the entire lens of biblical theology and say, wow, all of this is a fulfillment of the long-term plan of God. So even if we don't understand every segment, even if you look at it and you go, I don't really know, I don't know. we're going to take our best to take a few swings at it. We won't exhaust it. We will never exhaust it. But even if our, we don't understand it fully, all of us can take a look at that and by faith to say, I, I, don't, I, may not, I may not understand that completely, but I must respond to it with wonder and awe and praise and gratitude. And whatever it is, Lord, let it fill my heart with hope and let me live differently because of it. Somebody said yes. Okay, here we go. Picking up right at verse 3, the first thing we see is that, and now, now the, what we're looking at is the holy city, this, 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 this symbolically described massive new city. It's the new dwelling place. It's, it's the, the new Jerusalem, the, the holy city. Okay? And, it's a, and it's, we talked about how massive it is. It's all described symbolically. But here it is. This, but that, this is heaven. This is where we live. Okay? And it's descended. It's on the earth. It's really big, and it's massive, and it's cool. But the holy city will be characterized by the throne of God. The second half of verse 3 says, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. See, the throne here it has in the book of Revelation has been the centerpiece. It has been the epicenter of this story ever since chapter 4. When John finishes writing the letters to the churches, he hears a voice that says, come on up here. He steps in and he steps and he sees the throne room and he sees all the four living creatures and the 24 elders and crowns everywhere and thrones everywhere, light everywhere, brilliant colors everywhere, glory and awe and wonder and people throwing themselves down and throwing their crowns down, people crying out, holy, 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 holy it is a holy mess up there it is chaos and yet it's a perfect concert of worship 
and all and, and there is there is things that God, that John can't begin to describe and you and I might like at Disneyland look around look around look around look around but no but he well while, he, while you might be tempted to look around and notice everything it seems like in the midst of all this beauty and wonder and awe everyone is consumed with the guy on the throne that in the wonder and the beauty of heaven that, that all of that nobody's paying attention all they can do they are captivated by the glory of the one on the throne Heaven is, and the, this is the centerpiece of heaven. And now we find, fast forward, 22, guess what? That throne, that place of unapproachable glory and light is dwelling among men. God's throne will be with us. Revelation 21, 30, verse 3 says, this is a fulfillment. The 21st chapter foretells this. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the living, the dwelling of God is among men. He will dwell among men, and they shall be his people, and God himself, God himself. Hear that phrase, God himself. This is a personal implication that God will personally, intimately, imminently dwell among us forever. This is the the denouement. This is the new normal. And because of that, that's the, that's, that because of that, we have verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, nor, nor mourning, nor crying, or pain, for the first things have passed away. And because his throne, see, his throne is the place where of, of, of absolute perfect reign. So when we see his throne will be with them, what we should understand is that in heaven, his reign will be perfect. Now, in heaven, it already is, but for eternity, his reign will be perfect. There will be no hindrance. There will be no resistance. Everything will be the absolute, explicit will of God. Now, the cool thing is that we should understand that because that is our destiny, that is the avalanche that's coming. That's why today, you and I, we pray for that. We contend for that. We aren't quite there at that place where it's an absolute given that everything that happens is His will. That's why, but right now, we have the pledge, we have the promise, and really we have the assignment to say, Lord, let Your kingdom come. Let Your will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so on earth. The entire Gospel of Matthew really is, is organized around that regal dynamic. As in heaven, so on earth. That's why Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom so that you can make, it, make stuff happen on earth. He said, whatever things have been bound in heaven, you will bind on earth. You are to implement. You are to imitate. You are to see the pattern and the will and the promise and the power of the heavenlies and cause those things to, bring, to be brought to bear upon the earth. And you are not to quit until one day there's no difference. If this is, if this is our goal, then we understand that we, don't, we will not stop until he says it's over, until he says it's done. Until then, we contend, we believe, and we have hope, we have courage, we have fortitude, we are stalwart, we are unstoppable, we are unsinkable, because we know how it ends. There is no stopping this thing. His kingdom will come. His will will be done as in heaven, so on earth. So you might as well reach for it now. You might as well pray for it now. You might as well believe for it now. He will reign. Very exciting. The next part says his bondservants will serve him. Cool. His throne will be there and his bondservants will. So this is the, this is the, this is the, the, the greatest expression here. The, the highest possible situation is bond servants will serve him. These, these, the word bond servant means those who, have, who serve in loving devotion. Bond servants are those who, who are not seized by force, but they surrender by free will. They surrender their lives completely to a master out of absolute adoration. Wow. You got you to feel that and say they will serve him. See, the New Testament already calls us his bondservants and so many times we are called the bondservants of the Lord. So really, here's the thing, friends. If our destiny in eternity is to, is to gladly serve Jesus, you might as well do it now. 
right? Right now, you are already, you're, you're stamped with, the, with that identity. So what it means to be a Christian today does not mean that Jesus is your homeboy. It does not mean that Jesus is your lucky charm. It does not mean that Jesus is just kind of a thing that you do. No, the model of who you really are is seen right here. You are, your whole life is given in service to your king. You are a bondservant. Serve the Lord Jesus. That's the only thing that is our highest and greatest calling. Then verse 4 says, they will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. Would you all say, we will see his face? face. (laughs) There's so many powerful things here. We will see his face. Right now, right now, the, the, at least historically, before the work of Christ, there has been this separation. But in the garden, The Bible says that Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening. They literally hung out together face to face. And this is God's design, his desire. It's not his last minute thought. And it's not reserved for the special or the unique or the the 144 or the 12 or the special or the lottery winners or whatever else. God's desire is to live in eternity face to face with you. You ever been in a room where you're talking to somebody and you're talking to them, but all they do is they're looking, they're looking over you, they're looking at somebody else? Sometimes we do that and we don't mean to. We're not trying to be impolite, but you know what? We, 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 kind of, we don't focus or whatever. But it does kind of um, even unintentionally send a message. You know, if we're talking, but I'm looking at her. But I'm like, Well, all that says to you is it, it sends a, an unintentional message that you are just not important enough to have my full attention. But I don't understand how it's going to work because God is omnipotent and eternal. But somehow, some way, in, in heaven, there might be a bazillion of us, but I know one thing. He's going to look right, right square in my overgrown eyebrows. I may not even have to trim them much up there. But someday... That's, now, that's my future. So if that's my, understand that if that's my future, that, that means that, that that's also God's intent right now. He's not waiting. He's not delaying. That's a, if I see that in heaven, it signals God's desire now. Do you feel that? So what you, ah, I see that. That must mean that's what he wants. God's will doesn't change, right? So if I'm going to pray, your, your kingdom come, your will be done, I look at Revelation 21 and 22, and I say, well, that's his kingdom, and that's his will. So that's what I, that's what I focus on and desire and long for now. So right now, right? I don't. I, I, I know there's going to come a time when I'm going to see, see, see his face in a way that I, I don't see it now. But I do know that it is the longing of the human heart to see the face of God, to be near to him, to know him. And that is really the goal of redemption. Christianity is not a, a set of moral principles that we just follow, although we are following Jesus. Christianity is a supernatural experience where your sin is removed and you are brought near. You are brought near to God. I told first service that, that there's an example in Scripture in 2 Samuel where, where, uh, where Absalom, who is the, at, this, at that time had become the, the, the heir. So he is the, the, the son of the king, but because of his own re- horrible rebellion, he is cast out. He is, he is, he is fled away from from the king, from King David. David, who is a type of Christ and often serves as even a type of God. Not that he's God, but you understand type and symbolism. So what you have in the story, if you look at it, is, oh, look, here is the, a, a king and the son of the king, but, there, but the son of the king is, has fallen away and fallen out because of his own rebellion. The relationship is fractured. Sound familiar? And that relationship stays that way until someone intervenes. Joab, who's not a great guy sometimes, but Joab comes in as, as, a, as, a, as a mediator, and he mediates the two, and he brings them back together. How many, are, how many are glad that there is one man, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, that someone has stepped in between and brought us back together? But here's the difference. When Absalom was brought back into the city for two years, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 14, 28, for two years he did not see the king's face. 
So he came back, and too many times believers live like this is the call of God or this is the intent of God. That God, you know, like you're forgiven, but he's still kind of irritated with you. You're forgiven of your sin, but he doesn't really want to be close. Like, okay, you know, get in the back of the bus or you can kind of live on the outskirts. So that picture of Absalom, coming, he, can, he comes back, but he's not welcome to see the king's face. And what should have been an act of redemption and restoration only led to Absalom feeling further excluded and angry. And he, eventually, he set Joab's fields on fire. So that's a whole other story. Okay? But the idea is this, that, but that's not what happens with you and me. Don't live like you have only been invited back, back to the city, but not invited home. He didn't say come home but live in the shed in the backyard. Right? He invited you all the way in. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, that we have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Literally, you have been squeezed close. The blood of Jesus has seized you and God literally flexed and brought you close. You need, you, you need to believe that. You need to hear that because it's too easy for many folks to think that you're, if, you're, if, you, if you want to be close to God, you've got to try harder or you've got you've to improve your resume or perhaps, more likely, you think he's probably still overlooking you and looking at somebody else, somebody else you'd much rather spend time with. The blood of Jesus has literally done what you cannot do. What he, he, he has done with his own blood, by shedding his blood, he has done what you could never accomplish on your own. The word is brought near. Here, help me out, Eric. This is what happens. Come here. So this is you, and this is the blood of Jesus. Yeah, and it's this. Because the word is squeeze close. Squeeze close. He's, some of you he's got in a headlock because you need it. No, squeeze close. You are, because of the blood of Jesus, you are God's main squeeze. Seeing his face is, the, uh, is really the cry of humanity. Consider Psalm 42 too. The psalmist expresses his deepest longing. He said he thirsts for the living God and says this. Uh, the New American Standard says, when shall I appear before God? Literally, he says this, it's this. When shall I see the face of God? This is what you were created for. It is, that, it is the cry of your soul because you were created to know him. And he, it's his idea, and he's made a way. For now, to be drawn near by the Spirit, and one day face to face. Wow. There's so much more. John continues and says, His name will be on their foreheads. Now, what's interesting is I say that, and uh, it's quiet in the room. It's like people think, what is that, a Sharpie? Like... What do you mean? It's, you know, okay, well, and that's again because we read it in, our, in a 21st century perspective and we think, huh? Uh, that's not where name tags go, you know? Uh, but first of all, it's not your name, it's his. He writes his name on you. Now, we've already seen this actually in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3. Well, earlier on in the story of redemption, there's a great angel that shouts with a loud voice and he says, don't let anything happen to anybody. There's, there to, be, there's to be no judgment, nothing to be released. He said, because first of all, he said, not until the bond servants of the Lord have been sealed. So right, so right away what we see is this, as soon as you and I when you and I answer the call of God, and God initiates it, but when you, answer, when you pick up the phone and say, yes, Jesus, you don't feel me? When you say, you, you, nobody called God. You weren't looking for a phone, a phone booth and like, hello, you know, there's an operator, give me Jesus on the line. No, it's you, God called and you answered. But when you answer, 
When you said, yes, Lord, when you surrendered to his lordship, when you accepted his saving work, he sealed you. When you said yes, he sealed you. The moment you said yes, the Bible tells us that something happened, that God by his spirit has put a seal on you. And the the scriptures tell us that that seal is actually his name written on you by the Holy Spirit himself. You have been sealed with the spirit of promise and the name of God is on you. That means that you belong to him. You You are the authentic, sealed, owned, genuine article child of God you belong to him and what we see is that happened when you got born again and that seal stays on you forever it stays on you forever that means there's nowhere you can go right now God see he 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 won't lose track of you you say what if I go here will God lose me will God lose sight of me will God forget about me not a chance you've been marked you've been sealed you can't run away far enough he still sees you You can go to the moon and back. He'll find you. You can hide wherever you want to try to hide. You can, and I'll tell you what, you can grieve God's heart and do a lot of stuff, but he sees you. And for all all eternity, you will live as those who absolutely belong to him. And if that's your destiny, then that is your focus. That should inform your focus today. Hey, that's who I really am. That's who I'm going to be forever. Then today, you should live like those who belong to him. Your attitude, your conduct, your character, the way you even carry yourself, though the plans that you make. Do you know who you are? You are one who has been sealed. The name of God is on you. Let's live like that. Believe like that. Pray like that. Love others like that. Verse 5. We've only got one and a half verses so far, but this is it. Verse 5. There will no longer be any night. And they, the bondservants, will not have need of the light of a lamp nor of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. (laughs) There's so much to say here. I want to be sure I say it slowly and one thing at a time. Number one, listen to what the text says. You will not need a lamp or or the sun. So you will not need to or search for all sources of light. Okay, why, when you come into a dark room, normally, don't, other than the rascals in the room, normally you come into a dark room, the first thing you do is you start doing this, right? Where's that light switch? Where's, you, start throw, you start flailing about for the light switch. At least I do. I flail, okay? <laughs> flailing, and if you don't know where it is, then all of a sudden you panic, right? Why is that? Nobody, don't, other, other than the rascals in the room, don't, not, this isn't the time for jokes, nobody likes the dark. Dark bad light good people are if if you're out alone in in the in the black dark wilderness and you see a campfire that's what you do you people are drawn to it they're attracted because we know light good dark bad and that is that's human nature it's psychology and in the bible it's it's full of meaning darkness has everything to do with fear and confusion and 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 deception and the domain of satan now i'm not trying to be childish and tell you to be afraid of the dark or that there's a boogeyman in your closet i'm trying to just say that this really is as simple as it sounds dark bad light let's try it together shall we dark light Now, this is the second time we read this, that in in heaven, we're not going to be searching for or desperate for or looking for a way to turn on a light to get rid of darkness because there won't be any darkness. 
As a matter of fact, light will come from God Himself. He will shine on us. Meaning that there will be only truth, there will be only righteousness, there will be only hope, there will be only joy, there will be no dark, no fear, no shame, no deception, no dark powers, no trap, no dark, no bad. It's actually the fulfillment, again, this is again, this is the fulfillment of so much Old Testament prophecy. And I'm, you, now I go back and read Isaiah and go, oh, that's what he meant. Revelation 22. Listen to Isaiah 60, verses 19 and 20. No longer will you have the sun for light by day. Now, if I'm, re- if I'm reading that as a, even in Second Temple Judaism, I'm going to panic. What do you mean the sun's going to go away? That sounds scary. He said, you won't need the sun, nor brightness, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. And your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. Now here's the punchline. Always listen for the punchline, one of the last statements, especially in prophetic and poetic literature. The meaning, the punchline comes at the end. You ready for it? This is what all of that means. The day's of your mourning will be over. Dark, bad. Light, and in heaven, dark, gone. (laughs) Unga bunga, okay? In the age to come, there is no darkness. There's only light. In the age to come, we live by the light of God. We live without fear, without shame, without deceit. There is only hope. And therefore, if that is our future, that that's our identity, if that is our destination and our destiny, then it's also our identity and our reality. Our assignment now is to live like people of the light. We live without darkness, without fear of darkness, and certainly without participating in it. In the book of John, John, the Gospel of John, he says this, that this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. An attraction to darkness indicates a darkness in your own heart. But we, as a people of promise, must not love darkness. We must shun evil in every kind and every form and every attitude and every action that sounds or feels like darkness. Why? Because light is our destiny. And it's our calling even right now. Even right now. Listen. (laughs) Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. There's the Lord Jesus talking to his followers. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is for you. You are the light of the world. A city sit on a hill cannot be hidden, nor can anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, stay with me. Let your light shine before men in such a way or for this result that they may see your good works and what and do what glorify whom your father in heaven meaning people are supposed to see you and realize that there's more to come they see you and you're the evidence of heaven you got to challenge how you see church. Church isn't just us all getting together and, you know, singing and going home. You are the signpost of eternity. For the whole world, the whole world says, look, those are people who live differently. They don't live in the dark. They don't, they don't act like the dark. They don't have dark in them or on them or around them. They live and they radiate a light. And that light on them and in them is coming from another place. It's a place where they're going. They are the evidence of the age to come. That's and you demonstrate that literally by how you live. It's pretty cool. You ready to wrap this up? Here we go. Verse 5 concludes with this statement. And they will reign forever and ever. They will reign forever and ever. Everybody say that with me out loud. They will reign, they will reign. forever and ever. Forever. Woo! Now hang on just a minute. 
I know it because I, I said this first service too, and I was and I'm just I, I can listen to the room and get feedback and feel what's going on, and it's hilarious to me because if I say Jesus will reign forever, everybody will shout and throw their you know woo and their party cups and but if I say you'll reign, only two or three people go eh, and everybody else goes ah. And I get it. I totally get it. And I remember singing, Mom, I remember singing in church you know, growing up, and throughout eternity I'm going to praise him and I'll reign with him throughout eternity. Right? And we just got to, all hail King Jesus. Why do I sing all hail King Jesus and then say, I'll reign with him through? I don't want to sing about me. I don't care about reigning. I don't want to. I'm like those guys at the beginning of Revelation. I got a throne and a chair and a crown. I just throw myself down, throw my throne, my throat, my crown down and say, it's all about you. All I want is lay on my face before him. I don't want to reign. Well, that's the problem. It's because it's not your idea. You've missed the point. You don't know who you are. You don't know what. You didn't make you. You are not your own creator. So it's not up to you, Jack. <laughs> and to minimize or reduce who you are, smile big, insults the one who made you. So take a step back and understand just what his idea is. They will reign forever and ever. They is referring to the bondservants who see his face and bear his name. And those who, listen, so those who serve him will reign with him forever. Friends, this is what you were created for. This was his idea. See, God does not, did not create you to be his minion, to, just to reign over you. But his long-term best desire is to invite you into his dominion. He created all of this to share it with you. He wants to invite you into his dominion. Not to rule over others, but to reign with him. Re look at Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 real quick, and I'll just read you these passages. Let you, let you see this. This is already a reality in your life by the Spirit. Because the challenge is this. Here's the, here's the point. If your destiny is dominion, then you need to begin living with dominion in your hearts right now. You are seated with Christ. But first let me prove it, and then let me explain what I'm saying. Paul talks about Christ when he rose from the dead. And he said, Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And here's her, verse 21 describes how far, what, how significant Christ's rule is. You want to hear it? Here it goes. Far above. How? How, bo how above? Far. A wee bit? No. Just squeaking out a little bit? You know, like, like an Olympic finish? Ooh, it was a close one at the end there, Jesus. No. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, listen to it, in the age to come. It's never outside of the New Testament narrative, this age to come. But we see that in this age and in the age to come, he has the name of every single name. Listen to this. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as the head of all things to the church. All of, where, where did we come from? All of a sudden, we come a part of this story which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Fast forward, chapter 2, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive with Christ, by grace you have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's actually written in the past tense. That's what he's already done. This is your identity. Why did he do that? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He just, it's, it's an absolute expression of God's kindness. It's not based on your resume or your performance. It's all 
and always a result of his promise. Always. You're going to reign with him in sharing his dominion forever. And, and the truth is, right now, right now, today, you are, a, you are a chosen. You are royal. You are a priesthood. Right now, you, you sit with Christ by the Spirit. Right now, you should be living, live with dominion in your hearts right now. That doesn't mean that you <laughs> treat other people like paupers and demand to be treated like royalty. No, that's the human counterpart. Counterpart, counterpart too, but uh, uh, it's, the, it's the human counterpart because Jesus modeled what, what royalty really looks like. Jesus comes as the king and takes off his garments, puts on a robe, and washes the feet of those he's about to die for. How can you live like that? How can you have such confidence, such fearlessness, such an ability to serve, willing to even appear totally debased? You do that when you have dominion in your heart. When you have dominion in your heart, you live like Jesus. You serve like Jesus. You're kind like Jesus. You give like Jesus. You pray like Jesus. You, you confront suffering like Jesus. You live with hope like Jesus. When you live with dominion in your heart, you live like Jesus. That's why Paul wrote in Colossians 3.17 that whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it as if it were him. Live as if everything you were doing as if it were Jesus. Now that is living with dominion. Friends, in the age to come, the Lord reigns, and so will you. I want you to consider what is revealed to us about our promise and our inheritance so that you will know how you should live now. Because your future determines your focus. So let me just repeat this again. You have been stamped with the future. Believe that you belong to God and draw near to Him. Walk in the light. Live with dominion in your heart. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And keep an eye on eternity. Would you pray with me? Let's stand together. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call upon his name really means to answer the call of him. He's already called your name. And to call on his name is to say yes to the command to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and asked him to be your Lord, I challenge you, I encourage you to consider surrendering, him, surrendering to him today. He's not begging you. Salvation is not an invitation. It's not a plead. I might plead with you, but God commands that we repent and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's really a matter of obeying or not, surrendering or resisting. Tonight we're going to have water baptism, and if you've never made clear or made public your, your surrender to Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, I encourage you to come tonight. At the end of the service, you'll be baptized in water. It's a public confession. It's the biblical response, confessing your faith in Christ. We can pray with you today. We'd love to pray with you today, pray with you, pray for you. But right now, you can just begin by saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I turn away from all of that. I turn away from everything that is contrary 
And Lord, what I want is for you to be my king. Let your will, let your kingdom come and your will be done in my heart, in my life today, right now. Jesus, be my Lord. And that turning of faith welcomes his spirit into your life. Father, I thank you for the promise that we have in, in the name of Jesus. Because of Christ's work, we have the promise of the age to come. And all of that power and all of that promise is right now living inside us and influencing and inspiring our lives. Help us, Lord, to live as people who are stamped with eternity. And Lord, may we be the signpost for the, all the world that there is an age yet to come. May our lives give hope. May our lives bring healing. May our lives shine your light. This we pray in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. I hope many of you will come back tonight and believe with us for God to change some lives. God bless you. Be kind to someone on your way out. Be super nice. Say an encouraging word.